In our previous episode detailing the tale of Westeros' most unfortunate illegitimate son, we discussed the desperate defense of the wall and the blossoming leadership capabilities of Jon Snow. However, in spite of the ferocious fight put up by the Bastard of Winterfell and his cadre of Brothers of the Night's Watch, the sheer weight of numbers which the Free Peoples could bring to bear would eventually ensure that Castle Black would be overrun. That is, unless a relief army was to come from the south. But in the absence of such aid, no organized force within miles could stop the King Beyond the Wall. In this episode, we will discuss the culmination of the battle beneath the wall and what was to come in its aftermath. Time and again, the Night's Watch had thrown back the tide of free folk, which sought to overwhelm the defenses of Castle Black. However, each successful repulsion came at a huge cost to the already depleted Brotherhood. One would believe that the return of Sir Alistair Thorne and Janos Slint would bring with them a degree of intelligence and leadership nous, which could prove pivotal in the dying embers of the conflict. However, this perception would prove to be a misguided one, as the duo immediately sowed discord within the ranks by having Jon Snow imprisoned for desertion. To strengthen their charges against the Bastard of Winterfell, the already imprisoned Rattleshirt was brought forward to testify against the nascent Jon Snow. Rattleshirt subsequently confirmed the accusations, informing the Night's Watch of Jon's actions in slaying Corin Halfhand upon the Frostfangs. This was all the testimony Sir Alistair and Janos required, and they subsequently ignored any explanation given by Jon, who tried in vain to explain Corin's final instructions to his jailers. Maester Aemon was then forced to intervene to ensure Jon was not summarily executed by sending a raven to Cotter Pike at Eastwatch. This swift and pertinent action saved the life of the Bastard of Winterfell, confined to the ice cells for four days as the stalemate outside the wall continued. Fortunately for the Night's Watch and the denizens whom they protected from the wildling tide, this was not to be the only act of Maester Aemon which was to pay dividends, for the elderly Maester had sent ravens far and wide throughout the Seven Kingdoms, seeking the intervention of the great lords of the land. The vast majority of these ravens fell upon deaf ears, with events of a supposed grander scale transpiring throughout Westeros. One such letter would, however, make its way to Dragonstone, where a certain Stannis Baratheon now resided after his defeat at the hands of the Lannisters in the Battle of the Blackwater. Although the rightful heir of Robert now found himself at equally as low an ebb as that of his compatriots now manning the wall, the importance of wise counsel at a crossroads moment was once more to be shown. In this instance, it was to come in the form of the ever loyal and honest to a fault former smuggler Davos Seaworth. At the time, Davos's position in court was anything but sincere. This was due to the fact that the Red Woman, Melisandre, through her dark machinations, counseled to have Robert's bastard, Edric Storm, sacrificed to wake a stone dragon beneath the fortress. To ensure this would not come to pass, Davos, alongside several men who had recanted from the faith of Rahollor, smuggled the bastard from the island to leave him under the care of Sir Andrew Estemont. The response of the king evoked the words of House Baratheon, Ours is the fury, as Stannis believed that Davos had now thrown away their final chance at a hasty resolution to the War of the Five Kings. Davos was, fortunately, able to sway the unruly Baratheon from the dark path Melisandre was leading him down. Urging his king to set sail for the wall, he handed him the letter from Maester Aemon, before stating, a king protects his people, or he is no king at all. Stannis, a man wed to duty, accepted this call for aid, and allowed Melisandre to sacrifice a man to Rahollor, which gained the fleet favourable winds on their voyage north. His wife and daughter, Selyse and Shireen, were left at Eastwatch by the sea, before marching with all haste and in full force to meet the king beyond the wall and fulfill his duty of protecting his people as the rightful king of the Seven Kingdoms. At the wall, the Night's Watch, unaware of their impending salvation, continued their dogged defense in the absence of their charismatic young leader. However, having suffered four days alone within the ice cells, 
John was required once more to fulfill his role as a brother of the Night's Watch. The king beyond the wall, Mance Raider, had requested a parley, which Sir Alistair and Janos believed to be a ploy. As such, they selected Jon Snow as their envoy to the Wildlings, believing they were sending the bastard to his death. Exhausted and still feeling the effects of his time within the ice cells, Jon was carried over the wall by way of the winch cage with the secret order of assassinating Mance. Tormund escorted the young crow to Mance's tent, where the negotiations would take place. The king beyond the wall took a hard line throughout these negotiations, and immediately informed Jon that the warg Faramir Stickskins had utilized his eagle to gauge the number of the Night's Watch men remaining. The depleted numbers of the defenders had given Mance cause to be confident, a confidence which was further bolstered by his possession of the Horn of Winter, which, if the legends were to be believed, was capable of bringing down the wall. However, in a moment of candor, Mance revealed that it was not his wish to destroy the wall. Rather, he would utilize it to protect his people from the looming threat of the White Walkers. Therefore, the former ranger suggested a compromise whereby he would hand over the horn if he and his people were allowed to pass through the gates and make a home for themselves in the south. This compromise came with an important caveat that the free folk would not yield to the laws of southern lords and would abide by their own rules and customs. If the offer were rejected, dire consequences would follow for the Brotherhood, for Tormund would sound the horn at dawn some three days later, ending the defense of Castle Black in one fell swoop of mythical proportions. At this point, Jon was left with yet another of the difficult decisions which had come to define him, whether to sacrifice his honor and kill Mance, saving the watch in the process, or return to the wall with the offer which had been presented to him. However, just as Jon was to make his choice, the king at Envoy's attention was drawn to the sound of a war horn coming from the east. Mance immediately jumped into action, attempting to organize a hasty defense of the camp. This defense was to be in vain, and the hope of yet another king beyond the wall was to be dashed just as they reached the moment of their supposed inevitable triumph. A combined force of some 1,500 knights, mounted soldiers, mounted bowmen and men-at-arms, supplemented by an unquantified number of experienced rangers from Eastwatch, had swept down upon the camp. The oncoming charge of the heavy Baratheon horse was comparable to the strength and ferocity of a tidal wave, and the onslaught proved unstoppable, decimating the wildling lines in a matter of moments. Melisandre likewise played her part in the conflict burning Varamir's eagle from the sky, which caused the wildling wargs to be cast to the ground in brutal spasms of pain. Events went from bad to worse for Mance when his wife Dalla went into labor due to the stress of the situation, leaving only Jon and Val to assist her within the tent. Harmer Dogshead, who led the vanguard of the wildling force, was quickly cut down in this initial charge, while Tormund's son Dormund was also slain by a knight, presumed to be Sir Richard Horp. The chaos which ensued even caught John unawares, who, rather than join the battle, defended Mance's tent, unsure of who his would-be saviors even were. And through the smoke another wedge of armoured riders came on barded horses. Floating above them were the largest banners yet, royal standards as big as sheets, a yellow one with long pointed tongues that showed a flaming heart and another like a sheet of beaten gold, with a black stag prancing and rippling in the wind. Robert, John thought for one mad moment, remembering poor Owen. But when the trumpets blew again and the knights charged, the name they cried was Stannis, Stannis, Stannis. The battle, if one would deign to call it such, was effectively ended when the horse of Mance Raider was slain beneath him, which caused the wildling lines to break in their entirety. The giants, however, would not surrender or flee, and fought desperately against the Southrons, with Sir Godfrey Faring bringing low one of their number, a feat which earned him the moniker Giant Slayer. At the conclusion of the slaughter, Mance, alongside 1,000 other members of the Free Folk, was taken prisoner. Alongside their number were Val and Mance's newborn son, who would be named Aemon Steelsong, for whom Dalla had given her life in childbirth. After his triumph, Stannis took up residence in Castle Black, 
occupying the king's tower, from where he was to plan his next move in order to claim his birthright of the Iron Throne. The former Lord of Dragonstone was quick to assess the options available to him, and offered to legitimise Jon Snow and name him Lord of Winterfell in return for helping him secure the loyalty of the North. Moreover, Jon was to be wed to Val, which Stannis believed would ensure the loyalty of the Free Folk, who could potentially bolster his own forces in the fight with the Boltons. The Night's Watch was also forced to begin the vote for the new Lord Commander, following the death of Geon Mormont at Craster's Keep. However, the Watch remained a disunified organization, and after ten days of deliberations, no such Lord Commander had been decided upon. This frustrated Stannis, who wished to negotiate over possession of the new gift, and a number of the castles of the Watch. Stannis's patience continued to wane during this stalemate, and he threatened to choose a Lord Commander for them if they could not do so themselves. Samuel Tarly quickly realised that Janos Slint was on the verge of winning the vote. Through his own initiative, Sam negotiated with Sir Denis Malister and Cotter Pike, who held command of the Shadow Tower and Eastwatch by the Sea, to give up their claim to the Lord Commandership and support Jon instead. As a result, Jon Snow was elected to the position of Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, entirely unaware of his own candidacy and during a period in which he was still deliberating upon Stannis's offer. Having refused the offer of the King, a disbelieving Jon was subsequently elected the 998th Lord Commander, to the chagrin of Stannis, who had hoped to use him in a role which could quickly turn the tide against the Boltons throughout the North. However, Stannis remained a practical and rational man, and quickly pivoted in order to ensure he could still make the most of his current position. Having gleaned what he could of the White Walkers from those present in Castle Black, word was hastily sent to the Castellan of Dragonstone, Sir Roland Storm, to begin mining dragonglass to counter the threat posed. Allowance was also made for the Free Folk to pass through the wall and settle within the gift. However, this offer hinged upon the willingness of the Wildlings to convert to the worship of Rahalor, an offer which was taken up by the Lord of Bones and the newly minted leader of the Thens, Sigon, who led their followers south. Mance Raider was supposedly burned at the stake for treason and defiance, but unbeknownst to those who would witness the execution, the individual who was killed was not Mance, but Rattleshirt. Stannis would require a man of Mance's talents in what was to come, and as such, allowed Melisandre to place a glamour upon the unfortunate Rattleshirt, leading the majority of those living within the North to believe the King Beyond the Wall had perished. Those who came south only made up a minority of the wildlings who had survived the battle. A far greater proportion of the remaining Free Folk had fled into the haunted forest, Many followed a rider who led them to the milk water, with hundreds more following a warrior of dour temperament to Then, The vast majority followed Mother Mole to Hardhome, a number estimated by Bowen Marsh to be some 6,000 wildlings, while a further 3,000 wildlings followed Tormund. As one of his first acts as Lord Commander, Jon Snow sent Val into the haunted forest to find Tormund and begin negotiations with his one-time friend and ally. However, Jon's amiable and reconciliatory treatment of the wildlings would ultimately widen the rift amongst the Brotherhood, which, even in the direct aftermath of the battle beneath the wall, had begun to fester. However, this is a story for another day. The next few videos in this series will conclude the tale of Jon Snow up to the events of the Winds of Winter, but in the meantime, we're planning to cover the battles of many other fantasy, sci-fi and space opera universes, so make sure you have subscribed and pressed the bell button. Please consider liking and sharing as it helps immensely, and don't forget to comment. We will try to read and respond to every comment, as we want to know what you think about this video and which videos you hope to see in the future. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.